Due to the rise of social justice verbiage in pop culture, one of the most popular terms of the last decade was cultural appropriation. The term is defined as the inappropriate and uncredited use of customs, practices, and ideas of a culture by someone of a dominant culture. The term in hip hop culture used to describe someone who's culturally appropriating is a culture vulture. Being labeled a vulture implies the accused person did not genuinely live or interact with the culture before using it. The vulture label also implies the accused person unfairly profits from the use of a vulnerable culture. In the past, the strongest culture vulture accusations were slapped onto white executive figures such as Mark Echo, Lior Cohen, and Jimmy Iovine. While artists such as Vanilla Ice and Post Malone have also been accused of vulturing, it's hard to argue any hip hop artist has faced more intense accusations of this particular crime than Drake. With the persona and discography influenced by Afro-Caribbeans, Londoners, American Southerners, and of course, Torontonians, Drake's globetrotting has been viewed as both boundary pushing and predatory. In this video, we'll examine the validity of the top claims on either side of the Drake culture vulture debate. To start, let's look at the known facts of Drake's cultural experiences in his personal and professional life. Drake was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, the product of a Jewish Canadian mother, Sandy Graham, and black American father, Dennis Graham, hailing from Memphis, Tennessee. According to a 2013 XXL interview done by Dennis, Drake spent summers in Memphis between the ages of 5 and 17. According to a complex cover story on Drake in 2011, Drake's Toronto upbringing is split into two periods. Living in the working class West End on Weston Road, then living in the affluent Forest Hill neighborhood as a teenager. In Forest Hill, Drake and his mother lived in a duplex. After first attending Forest Hill Collegiate Institute, he transferred to Vaughn Road Academy in the less affluent Oakwood Vaughn neighborhood. This neighborhood had a rougher reputation and was home to many first generation Canadian families. According to the 2006 Canadian census, Italian, Portuguese, English, and Filipino were the most popular ethnic backgrounds in the neighborhood. The neighborhood is also known for having many Caribbean shops and restaurants since Little Jamaica extends into the neighborhood. Specific references to Italian culture Drake recently made in his work, including the Italian pronunciation of Don Corleone and Meek Mill's Going Bad, as well as the 2019 song Omaretta, can possibly be traced back to experiences with Italian Canadians in Oakwood Vaughn. After linking up a Lil Wayne, Drake made a more permanent move to the South. He recorded his breakout EP So Far Gone in Houston, Texas, a city where he claims he got his swagger back. Along with forging the mentor mentee Bon Weezy, Drake befriended Houston legend Bun B and found home in local venue Warehouse Live, a place he fondly references and nothing was the same in the song Too Much. Houston's influence on Drake's expression can be seen as early as the 2009 song November 18th and as recently as Teenage Fever in 2017 with the slowed Jennifer Lopez sample. From there, Drake's globetrotting really takes off. He put roots in Jamaica as early as 2010 when he shot the video for Find Your Love There, connecting with dancehall veteran Movado who featured in the video. Find Your Love received criticism from Jamaica's Minister of Tourism for portraying Jamaica negatively, but the video was defended and praised by Movado's camp. As we now know, Drake's decade-long relationship with Jamaican artists has seen him work with artists such as Beanie Man and the new OVO signee Popcan. Years later in 2016, he cited dancehall legend Vibes Cartel as one of his biggest inspirations. In 2010, Drake started planning roots in Los Angeles. It's well documented that he's one of the first major artists to give Kendrick Lamar a look. But YG also attested to Drake's due diligence in a Breakfast Club interview in 2013, where he explained that Drake was scouting him years before their hit collaboration, Who Do You Love? 
According to YG, they met at a Roscoe's in 2010, and Drake later came to a YG and Nipsey concert in 2012. Drake also made a cameo in YG's 2013 video for I'm a Real One. In the same way Jamaican culture is unavoidable in Toronto, Drake's first interaction with British street culture was likely as a kid. But in the public eye, Drake's first real steps into the world of UK rap and Afrobeats happened in 2015, with an interpolation of bars from Skepta's track, That's Not Me, used in his feature on Lil Wayne's Used To. Drake then included Skepta in his noteworthy credits on If You're Reading This It's Too Late. From there, he remixed WizKid's song with Skepta, remixed Dave's Wanna Know in 2016, and dropped One Dance featuring WizKid and Kyla dropped more life with gigs and Skepta features, and sprinkled UK slang and references throughout his 2018 offerings, including God's Plan. And not to mention, can't take a joke. Also in 2018, he visited London during his Scorpion press run to do a fire in the booth freestyle for funk master flex equivalent Charlie Sloth, and a behind the bars freestyle for the Link Up TV, which he later placed on a soundtrack for Top Boy in 2019, a hit British TV show he had a major hand in reviving. Drake's most recent nod to the UK culture is the drill inspired single War. Given Drake's upbringing and track record as a professional, there are several things we can claim are true about Drake's use of culture. He's familiar with many cultures as a result of his upbringing, and he forms relationships with leaders and rising stars of a culture before he uses elements of a culture in his own work. These two facts address the issue of Drake's authenticity as well as his respect and acknowledgement of his influences. These facts give Drake more credit than many critics want to give him, but they don't answer every question about his wandering cultural expression. Even with Drake's background and ties to cultural gatekeepers, one concern that remains is his use of accents and foreign slang excessively. Despite his demonstrated knowledge of the cultures he dips into, many are rubbed the wrong way by Drake's use of patois and roadman lingo in his music. On one hand, we've all heard Drake in interviews or seen him on screen, so we know many of the words and inflections found in his music are not in his everyday speech. On the other hand, music is a commonly accepted way of using and sharing new lingo. In the same way, most American rap fans are not from LA or Atlanta, but know how to comfortably use terms like bull and trap and no cap, Drake's cultural exchange happens both within and beyond American and Canadian hip hop. While it may irritate listeners to hear a song like Blem or War, there has never been a critical mass of backlash from Afro-Caribbean or Black British listeners saying Drake's use of their speech patterns was either inaccurate or overindulgent. Another point in the Drake culture vulture accusations is that he reaps most of the benefit whenever he uses elements of another culture for his own work. This is rooted in the idea that as one of the biggest artists in the world, anyone Drake collaborates with enters a capitalistic power imbalance. People who use this argument believe if an artist lends Drake a hot hook or a hot song to remix, he is guaranteed to benefit much more as a result of his status at the expense of a smaller artist losing their momentum. In individual cases, Drake has been guilty of this. I Love McConan and Moji are great examples of artists whose careers really suffered after Drake found inspiration in them. Despite these cases of shady business, Drake's track record in collaborating with less established artists contains many no-strings-attached favors and genuine relationships. From 21 Savage to Fetty Wap to Blockboy JB, many young artists that Drake has been accused of leeching off have positive documented experiences with them, including a very humble request to remix Fetty's My Way and essentially gifting Blockboy JB his biggest single to date, Look Alive. This pattern of behavior extends into Drake's global collaborations. Before adopting the Heedy One flow for the single War, he gave Heedy a spot on the Top Boy soundtrack with the banger Hard to Believe. Before his louder ventures into UK drill, Drake credited British rappers Octavian and drill pioneer Lowski of the Harlem Spartans as influences for the album Scorpion. He also gave Dave two tracks on the Top Boy soundtrack a couple years after being allowed to remix Wanna Know. 
Other miscellaneous acts of respect and acknowledgement include his frequent use of IG to quote and shout out artists he's feeling, including Section Boys in 2016, as well as joining or bringing younger artists on stage to give a platform or show support. Last April, rising UK artist and Afro swing pioneer Jay Huss announced his freedom from an eight-month jail stint at a Drake show in London O2 Arena. In dealing with dancehall and UK acts like Skepta, Giggs, Popcan, and Beanie Man, he's working with legends of their respective cultures. In these cases, assuming they were played for clout when they themselves claim that Drake's work was not exploitative and a bold claim of authority for any critic to be making, especially critics who aren't Afro-Caribbean or British. With the occasional diss from local leaders, such as Houston's Sauce Waka and grime legend Wiley, the most accomplished and respective creatives in the culture that Drake pulls from view his work as a legitimate cultural exchange. Drake's artistic approach has always been to polish his many influences into new, appealing flavors of his own stories. Also, being at the top of the industry and searching for inspiration does not make him responsible for the success of less established collaborators. The belief that Drake unfairly profits from smaller artists because many don't sustain their success after working with him is based mainly on two misconceptions. First, that Drake can't sell records or make good music without wave writing, and second, that Drake owes new collaborators the world despite the fact that he's going out of his way to study, incorporate, and credit creatives of other cultures when his status and wealth don't require him to do so. Drake should not be given too much credit for reviving or elevating the sounds of Houston, London, and the Caribbean. But considering the lofty status he's had in music for about a decade, the research he does and public respect he gives to sounds and artists of other cultures is admirable. On the whole, Drake satisfies the major requirements of avoiding appropriation when using other cultures. He credits his influences, knowledgeably uses the stuff he takes, doesn't play into stereotypes, and has authentic connection to what he uses before he uses it. As a bonus, he voluntarily supports the growth of the cultures he dips into through organic collaboration, acknowledgement on his platforms, and sharing his platforms. For perspective, a simple statement from Kaz of UK rap review channel, Dan and Kaz, captures the misguided culture vulture accusations well. If he paid us in the UK no attention, he'd still be where he was. Whether you agree or disagree with our conclusion, we hope this video gave you the information and perspective needed to see the debate in a truer light. This has been a Hip Hop Madness original. Make sure to stay tuned and stay up to date with everything we got going on by hitting that subscribe button and notification bell. Oh, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Hip Hop Madness and join the movement.